Yo, what's going on guys? Let's talk about lithium. And I know Yobern didn't have a chance to talk about it in class, so I um I kinda read the textbook a little bit and I got some things from the notes here and there from Corsania from Kaleli to just um make this video. So I hope it helps. And alright, let's get into it. So lithium, we know is for bipolar disorder, right? And if you guys know the song uh, Lithium by Nirvana, it's a, gr it's a great song. Uh, Kurt Cobain is pretty much saying, like, throughout the song, he's like, oh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy, cause today... Right. Yeah, he's like, I'm so happy, I'm so sad. So that song kind of reminds me of Lithium and how it can be used for bipolar disorder. Um, okay, so we know bipolar disorder can be... Um, classified into a manic phase where you know the guys the patient's really super happy their the mood is really up and then it can also be a depressive phase so it's it's both of these pretty much and depressive just means there's just means that they're super sad and lithium itself can be used for acute episodes so, so when they're you know acutely having an episode um or it can be used for maintenance to prevent them like prophylactically kind of Okay, so uh, Dr. Yoburn wanted us to talk about three things, and that was pharmacodynamics, the mechanism of action, uh, you could ignore all this pink stuff for now, um, side effects, and kinetics. So that's what we're going to do. Um, we have to know that lithium primarily acts on the GQ coupled receptor, right? It doesn't antagonize it directly. It actually has an indirect action, but um, this is the main receptor that's going to act on the GQ. And in, pharmaco in terms of pharmacodynamics, I'm just going to mention these. I'll talk about them more in, de in depth later on. So it's going to inhibit inositol phosphatase. Um, it's going to inhibit GSK, which is glyco gly uh, glycogen synthase kinase 3. Uh, it also uncouples the GQ receptor, and it mimics sodium because it looks a lot like sodium. It looks a lot like sodium. Okay, so before I go into like the, the whole complicated mechanism, um, I want you guys to kind of you know review the the cell membrane and what it is. So I'm starting on the left side. I know it's a lot of text. Uh, I want, I'm gonna start on the left side. So we have um, on the outside is hydrophilic, right? We know the outside of the cell membrane is hydrophilic. We know the inside is also hydrophilic, and we know the cell membrane um, inside the actual membrane is lipophilic. And these are you know some phospholipids. <coughs> We have the hydrophilic head and the lipophilic tail. And you know, these are all scattered throughout. I just drew a couple. These are scattered throughout. So here's one expanded. Here's one that's um, a specific phospholipid. And that's called PIP2. So what does PIP2 stand for? If you look at the, the bottom left, I wrote out PIP stands, PIP2 stands for phosphatidyl and nosotol 4,5 biphosphate. And you can kind of deduce from the name, it kind of, you know, uh, it looks similar. So P stands for phosphatidyl, I stands for inositol, and P2, what does P2 stand for? Well, 2 just means bi, so you can ignore the 4, 5, it just means uh, biphosphate. So P2 is biphosphate. P3 would be triphosphate, for example. Okay, so we have this, uh, this phospholipid, right? This is a phospholipid. Phospholipid. So then let's see what happens. Remember how the how lithium acts on the GQ couple receptor? It's not really an antagonist, but you'll see later on what it does. So let's say something binds to it, right? Something activates the, the GQ receptor. And um, what that does is that activates, you know, downstream pathways. And ultimately it's gonna activate this thing, PLC, which is phospholipase C. And what phospholipase C does is just it cleaves phospholipids so we have a phospholipid right here the the PIP2 so it's going to cleave that and where does it cleave it cleaves right here let me use a different color it cleaves right here oh, okay that was bad like right here so then it forms two things it forms IP3 and it forms um, DAG so IP3 is just a um, nosotile Remember how I said three P3 is just triphosphate, so no cell triphosphate, and you can see right here one phosphate, two phosphate groups, three phosphate groups, and just FYI, and no cell just looks like this. Literally, just like a cyclohexane with the six OH groups. 
that's inositol, inositol, sorry. So if it's triphosphated, you know, three of these, um, I think it's a one, three, four, one, four, five are phosphorylated. So one, you would say two, three, four, and five are phosphorylated. Um, okay, and then the other product is DAG, which is just diacylglycerol. So glycerol, the glycerol backbone is just this. The glycerol backbone is just this, right? It's just a propyl group with uh, three OHs, one OH, two OH, three OH, and then you, you got the diacyl group right here, these two long uh, fatty acid chains. That's what it breaks down into. That's the whole, you know, that's the basic understanding of it. So the next, um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is I'm going to use a diagram from the actual book. And sorry, I just wanted to mention one more thing. So IP3 and DHG, what do these do? These um, these just cause the effects of bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder. Normally, I think in humans, you know, if these are activated, like these are in all of us, right? If they're activated, they're okay. I'm guessing in bipolar disorder, these are overreactive. So then they produce the bipolar effects. Okay, so this is the diagram from, from the textbook. And um, this is pretty much what we have before. We have the, the PIP2, which is the phospholipid. It's a substrate for PLC, which is phospholipase C, and it cleaves um, PIP2 into two products, the DAG and IP3. And these are what mediate the bipolar effects. Okay, so we know this, but let's. What if we ask, um, how does PIP2 get regenerated, right? Um, like, where does it come from? And actually, it doesn't come from outside. It comes from within. So IP3 is the main, um, the main. Um, precursor for PIP2, but it doesn't go straight like that, all right? It doesn't regenerate straight like that. Instead, it goes through a whole circle process. It goes through a whole process to regenerate this, and that's where the lithium comes in. It kind of inhibits right here within the process. So I'm gonna, um, you know, undo some of these and show you the rest of the diagram. Okay, like, hey, so this is the rest of the diagram. What we had was right here, we cut up right up to here. <clears throat> So now we have IP3, right? So IP3, it can mediate effects, but also needs to get recycled. So IP3, IP3, we, we know, um, just FYI, IP3 is just the nosotol. Uh, um, and then it goes to IP2, which is, you know, nosotol biphosphate. And then it goes to IP1, which is just um, inositol monophosphate, right? This just means, um, I'm, I'm writing inositol, it just means monophosphate, okay. So then after that, the, the final the final phosphate, there's one left here on, on the mono, it gets cleaved off and it just forms inositol. And inositol, remember, was just this, you know, the cyclohexane with the, with the six um, OH groups. I'm not gonna draw them, but you know what I mean, the six OH groups. So inositol. Now we know. Now we need inositol, and we need it to get back to PIP2. So then, you know, phosphates start getting added on. So we get we get one. We get one phosphate added on. We get um, the P in front actually means um, the um, phosphatidyl. So phosphatidyl just means um, instead of just a simple phosphate getting added on, it gets you know the whole. It gets a phosphate group within the chains because we need the fatty acid chains, right? So the P in front just stands for phosphatidyl. And the P's behind I stand for just phosphate. So it goes to phosphatidyl and nosotol. Then it goes to phosphatidyl and nosotol. Uh, monophosphate, because there's only one P. And then phosphatidyl, nosotol, biphosphate, or PIP2, which is what we have, right? PIP2, phosphatidyl, and nosotol, biphosphate. This is what we have, this structure right here. Okay, so that's how that's how it gets recycled. So where does lithium come in? Lithium comes in uh, between these two steps when it goes from IP two to IP three and IP I, I'm sorry sorry uh, IP two to IP one and IP one inositol. So it stops the cleavage kind of right. So ultimately, if I could summarize this in um, in a phrase, it would be lithium inhibits inositol phosphatase. Phosphatase is an enzyme that cleaves phosphates off right. So obviously, if we go, if we went from, from two phosphates to one phosphate, a phosphate has to be cleaved off, right? And lithium inhibits that process. Lithium also inhibits another process right here. 
where it goes from the single phosphate to nil phosphate. So basically all it does is it um you know less you're gonna get less inositol formed because you know there's uh there's less cleavage, right? It's gonna inhibit the cleavage. You're gonna get more buildup of IP IP two and IP one and really just less inositol. And if you get less inositol, you know ultimately you're gonna get less PIP two, which is the phospholipid that's really important you need. And then um less PIP2 means less IP3 and DHE which are really going to mediate the bipolar effects. So if you have less of them, you get less bipolar effects. Pretty simple, right? So that's the whole basis. And um, these two enzymes are, like a broad term would be inositol phosphatase, but um, I think it's, um, the book says, let me look it up. Okay, so these are the enzymes that are actually cleaved. I found it from the book. Um, so we have the step that goes from right here. We have the step that goes from uh, IP2 to IP1, and that enzyme is inositol polyphosphate 1 phosphatase, and lithium is going to inhibit that. The next enzyme it's going to inhibit is from IP1 inositol, and that's inositol monophosphate. So only one phosphate is going to inhibit that. And this is polyphosphate, you know, two phosphates. The name kind of makes sense. Um, ultimately, you know, there's it's a long name, but in the end, it's going to be nosotyl phosphatase, right? Nosotyl phosphatase, phosphatase, and that's what lithium really inhibits. So it inhibits the regeneration of a nosotyl. Okay, so let me just touch upon lithium's um, uh, the few other mechanisms that it has. It's nothing major, but um, I just want to make sure I kind of talk about them in case uh, Dr. Yolburn Dr. Yolburn puts it on the test. And the second mechanism is just inhibit. Um, GSK3, which is the, the glycogen synthase kinase 3, and that's just involved in cell signaling. So I guess if you're inhibiting, I don't really know, the, the textbook doesn't really say like what the, the mechanism is, but I guess if you're inhibit that, you get less bipolar effects. Uh, number three is uncouples um, GQ receptor. So basically, this kind of, um, this is like a direct action on the GQ receptor. Basically, uncoupling it just means um, you have the actual um, receptor and you have the G protein, right? The G protein, and it's just going to make this leave. So it's going to leave, and you're going to get two, uh, two parts. And if they're not together, they won't work. So that's more of like a direct action on the GQ receptor. The last one is just mimic sodium. So, you know, sodium is involved in action potentials. Like, um, lithium can kind of mimic it. Um, the textbook kind of said it couldn't really generate action potentials because lithium is too small or something like that. But I think it's just important to know that it can mimic sodium and, you know, copy some of its effects. Okay, so a lot of text, um, and I'll explain it all. So, side effects. You can kind of look at Dr. Corisani's slides, too. Cause she, I think she has the alphabet, like A, B, C, D, all the way through H side effects and these are you know what I just got from the textbook um, so the number one side effect is tremor tremor is really common at therapeutic doses so if you you know um, it's important to assess the patient and make sure it's not out of control number two side effect hypothyroidism you could also get hyperthyroidism and this is a, really a consequence of the GQ receptor being uncoupled because um, I think uh, the receptors for thyroid hormones are also GQ receptors, and um, you know if you kind of give lithium, you'll uncouple all of them, whether they're thyroid GQ receptors or other ones. So it'll affect your th thyroid hormones, and it's, mon it's important to monitor the, your thyroid levels. Number three is going to cause diabetes insipidus, and I remember this because we remember when we had uh, Dr. Smith. She taught us about fluids and electrolytes, and she said that lithium was one of the most common. Uh, precipitators of diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus is also known as uh, SIDADH, symptom of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. So you're just peeing a lot, which is polyurea. You're just peeing a lot, and if you pee a lot, you'll get dehydrated, and you have to monitor electrolytes. Um, number four is going to be cardiac symptoms. So uh, I don't really know. Textbook didn't really say, just a cardiac, so just monitor EKG. Corsani also said cardiac symptoms, so just monitor the EKG. Number five is more about pregnancy. It's going to be Epstein's anomaly in babies. And um, it was mentioned in class that lithium you can't give during the first trimester, but 
second, third are all okay. And the reason why you can't give it, give it in the first trimester is that it can cause Epstein's anomaly. Number six, acne. You know, just check your skin. Uh, number seven, benign. I put this last because, you know, it sounds serious, but in the end it's still benign. So it's benign leukocytosis. Um, so it's not really going to affect you. It's benign, right? But you should just check CBC, complete blood count with differential occasionally. And some few things, and a few things that I didn't put. You always want to check the lithium levels because lithium kind of has a narrow therapeutic index, or I don't know, does it? Whatever. But you check. You still check the levels, and it's the ideal level. 0 0.8 to 1.2 mill uh, milliequivalents per liter in your body. And lastly, renal function, and I'm going to explain that in the pharmacokinetic section. Okay, so this is just the last part. Um, I'm almost done. Acute lithium levels, acute lithium levels. Let's take a look. Okay, so the ideal levels, if you're um, giving someone lithium acutely, is going to be, and this is just all from Dr. Corsani slides, 1.2, uh, 1 0.8 to 1.2 milliequivalents per liter. If it's maintenance, it's a little lower. 0.6 to 1.0. Um, and then toxic levels are if it goes over. 1.5 MEQ. That's when you see you start seeing some of the overdose effects. Um, and when when you want to monitor these levels, well, it's five days. Five days after you initiate initiate, um, and you take this, you take the, the level 12 hours after the last dose. The last dose on the fifth day, so 12 hours after the last dose on day five okay so that's it and just let's get to kinetics really simple there wasn't much in the textbook about kinetics so number one thing is no liver metabolism so if you know a patient has hepatic impairment it's okay you can still give it the main form of elimination since there's no metabolism in the liver is renal everything is pretty much excreted renally unchanged Right, so that's why it was important right here to monitor renal function. Um, and then plasma level is going to peak uh, within 30 minutes to 2 hours. And you get absorption, almost all, everything is absorbed um, within like 6 to 8 hours, I think. So yeah, that's it. Um, lithium, I mean, it's not too bad. I don't think Dr. Gilbert's going to ask us you know, like in-depth, in-depth questions, probably just one or two about lithium, mainly about its mechanism of action, which you, have, which, we, the, which you guys have to know is that inhibits, inhibits inositol, inositol phosphatase. Yep, that's it.